continuing my message. It's kind of strange how this works, but I'm continuing my message in, in Romans chapter 8. And um, I've entitled this morning's message, Why Bad Things Happen to God's People. And um, that's what the text uh, certainly uh, points us to, why bad things happen to God's people. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but some years ago, um, probably about 40, 45 years ago, maybe a little bit more, there was a rabbi named Harold Kushner who published a book that became a bestseller. The book sold millions and millions of copies, and it's still available today. I was just at the bookstore a few week, a couple weeks ago, and I, I seen the book on in the in the section of religious and spiritual books. But Rabbi Kushner and his wife, they had suffered the loss one of their children um, to a terrible disease. It was hard for them to handle, um, and out of that pain, the pain of that loss, they began to examine that question: Why God allows bad things to happen? to good people. Let us begin with a word of prayer and we'll get into this morning's message. Gracious Father, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to bring forth your word. This is a challenging topic, Lord, and I understand it's a challenging topic for many of us. Oftentimes we don't understand why we go through pain and pressure and problems. A lot of times our pain, our pressure, and our problems is created by our own actions, by our own choices and our own decisions. Yet, Lord, it's difficult to handle whether it's self-created or whether it just happens. So bless us as the word goes forth this morning. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Give us a divine download from heaven that we walk away here with greater peace than we came. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So why does, why does bad things happen to good people? Um, uh, Rabbi Kushner's book is... Why bad things happen to good people. My topic is why bad things happen to God's people. Um, this was a period of intense reflection for Rabbi Kushner. And so he codified his feelings and his journey into this book. And it became an instant bestseller. And probably for a lot of good reasons, but I can think of a couple of very good reasons. Number one... I think the book became a, a bestseller because it's very well written. I have this book in my own library, although when I was looking for it in the last couple of days, I couldn't find it, um, which often happens because I have too many books. Um, and then number two, it was a bestseller because it touched on a universal chord that a lot of people struggle with. Why bad things happen to good people? Everybody, sooner or later, they wrestle with the one word question, why? You know, why does this happen and why does that happen? Why does it happen to me and not so many other people? Why did this befall my doorstep? Pain, pressure, problems, loss. Why, why, why? Sooner or later we all ask that question, why? And sometimes if we're faithful, not only do we say why, we say why Lord? Because we're asking God and sometimes even crying out to God why he would allow this in my life. And then beyond that, we, we probably ask ourselves some other why questions. Why me? And why now? And why this? We ask ourselves all kinds of why questions. And I recommend the book because I think Rabbi Kushner um, has a great many helpful and, and wise things to say in his book. I've read the book at least two times that I can specifically remember, but from my standpoint as a believer in God and as a Christian believer, um, I think the rabbi does an excellent job presenting the problem. The problem of why uh, bad things happen to good people, but I really don't buy into his solution of why bad things happen to good people. And I'm not going to give you a book review this morning, so I'll spare you of that. But if you want the book um, that at least explains the problem from an honest point of view and from a, from a really good point of view, I would recommend it to you. And um, it's, it's certainly worth uh, 
obtaining a copy if you ever obtain a copy because if nothing else the book will stir your thinking and get you thinking about why bad things happen to good people but um, his is not the only book on such topics um, books on this general subject the general subject of human suffering they've been around not just for dozens of years books on this particular topic if you if you study literature at all, they've been around for hundreds of years. Christian thinkers have certainly written books and lots of books on this particular topic, the topic of human suffering and human pain. In fact, there's dozens of books. If you go to any Christian bookstore or the section of Christian books at a popular bookstore or secular bookstore today, you'd find that there's many books written on this very subject. You know, you might have heard <clears throat> several books. Um, I've read a few of the other books, and there's hundreds and hundreds of books written on this topic. Philip Yancey had a good book, and his book was entitled, Where is God When It Hurts? It's a very good book. I highly recommend it. It's from a Christian perspective. Where is God When It Hurts? Um, and some of the other books that you uh, might have heard about, about human suffering, there's an excellent book by Edith Schaefer called Affliction. There's also <clears throat> another book, God and Evil, by Gordon Wenham. Um, I, I personally have that particular book. And others may have read other books called Disappointment with God and so forth. And many of these books on this particular subject um, um, try to answer the question of, why is there human suffering? Why is there human pain problems and pressures? And there's no end to this particular question because human suffering never leaves us for very long. I mean, sooner or later, we're all going to suffer. Sooner or later, we're all going to experience great loss in life. And no matter how many times you try to answer this particular question, the questions about human suffering and human pain and pressure and problems, I mean... It comes back again and again and again because loss, suffering, pain, pressure, problems, they're always about us. And so our question is usually, where is God? Where is God when it hurts? Where is God when there's problems? Where is God when there's loss? Where is God in all of this? And not only where is God, we probably scratch our head and say, what is he doing? I mean, I mean... I think I know where he is, but what in the heck is he doing? He's probably just out asleep on the job or something. And then, again, we ask those other questions. Why me? Why now? Why this? And shake our heads. And sometimes we throw little temper tantrums because we think, well, I'm better than that. I don't deserve this, and I shouldn't have to deal with this. But lo and behold, you know, we have to deal with this. I speak often about Moody, Moody Bible Church and the Moody Institute and the Moody Church itself. And um, Moody has a publishing division and they have a radio division. And um, on my, I used to travel to Chicago about six to ten times a year and um, for business. And um, I used to know that, you know, as soon as I got to like Benton Harbor, I could turn my channel to Moody Radio and there would always be something good on the radio, something godly on the radio. And it's like, you know, we hear a lot of bad things about Chicago, but Moody's certainly a bright spot in Chicago. That's their home base. And um, some years ago, the Moody Magazine, which I used to subscribe to, um, it had a, an article and an ad for Dr. James Dobson from Focus on the Family. Because James Dobson wrote a book that uh, was entitled, Where's God When Life Doesn't Make Sense? Or When God Doesn't Make Sense? Um, and the ad said something like this, sooner or later, all of us will have reasons to ask this question. Why me, Lord? And Dr. Dobson, he's known that and says, every person who lives long enough will eventually encounter circumstances that are difficult to explain theologically. Cancer, sudden infant death syndrome, divorce, rape, loneliness, infertility, rejection, and a million other sources of human suffering that produce the inevitable question that troubles our soul. You know, sometimes the issues are so great, our souls become troubled and our faith becomes shaken because we don't think that 
the stuff that comes to our doorstep should even be there. And over the years, I've learned that you can't be fooled by the happy faces you see on people. You know, it's funny. People come to church on Sunday morning, and they smile at you, and how are you? And everybody, you know, has a story um, behind that smile. Everybody that comes to church and smiles or says everything's wonderful, you know, behind that smile, you know, you know that there's a story that includes pain. There's a story that includes suffering. There's a, there's a story behind that smile that has some kind of tragedy and, and, and turmoil. But behind each smiling face, you'll discover that there's a tale, a tale of pain, a tale of difficulty, a tale of heartache, because all of us have experienced these things. And many unanswered questions come about from people because most people, they don't really put into the parameters how and why these things happen to each of us. Not that we aren't happy. I'm not saying we aren't happy. Um, I'm a pretty happy guy, and I've experienced a lot of these such things. But, you know, at least most of us are um, at some point um, and another going to experience a lot of these these issues. You live long enough, you'll experience lots of these kind of things. You know, I don't mean to disappoint anybody in the first message of the new year, but no one gets a free ride through life. Mm -hmm. You know, some people think, well, I'm just going to get on the easy train. You know, I'm going to press the easy button. You know, they used to have that easy button. I think it was Staples Office Supply. You know, somehow there's this, there's this, there's this switch or this button and you slam on it and life just becomes easy. Well, it doesn't really work that way. At least that's not my experience. Into each life, some rain will fall. You know, that's what the Morton salt box used to say. Um, and uh, the, the Bible confirms that. It rains on the just and the unjust. So it rains on everybody. So if you think, well, I'm a super Christian, this kind of stuff shouldn't happen to me because... I'm better than everybody else because I have a pedigree in, in Christianity. No, it rains on everybody, right. the, the good and the bad. And just because you're gooder than somebody else or you think you're gooder than somebody else, it's going to rain on your parade whether you like it or not. You know, no one lives in sunshine forever. Although we'd like to live in sunshine forever, no one lives in sunshine forever. So in terms of suffering, I want to talk this morning first about the ways that we deal with suffering. Because not everybody deals with suffering very well. Um, uh, quite frankly, most of us don't deal with it uh, well at all. And I think there's four ways that most people use uh, suffering and how they deal with suffering when they're facing suffering, when they're facing difficulty, when they're facing pain, pressure and problems, how they deal with it. The first way most people don't successfully deal with it is denial. Um, this is where most of us begin when we have problems and pain and suffering. We're just in total denial. Um, you know, we take the John Wayne mentality. You know, we, we, we grit our teeth and smile even when we're hurting in a big way. And, um, you know, I think John Wayne said, never let him see you sweat. I'm sure John Wayne sweated a few times, but, you know, when someone's in denial, they won't admit the truth. They, they fail to admit the truth, even though they know the truth, they just won't admit the truth. You'll say, how you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing great, sure. You know you're not telling the truth when you say things like that, you know, and we're all like this occasionally. We all deal with denial in, in some way, in some shape. Um, there's something in all of us that makes us pretend that everything's okay, even when everything is not. When the ground beneath our feet is shaken and, and we just want to believe everything's okay. You know, we pretend the problem is not there. We pretend that it's not as bad as it really is. You know, so we play pretend. And a lot of us in, in our denial, we do a lot of other things too. We try escapism. Um, you know, we try to drink it away or drug it away or 
you know, fornicated away or whatever your vice is. Um, so when people are in denial, they have aberrant behavior that's not good or godly. It's just the behavior that they engage. Another, another way a lot of people um, deal with, um, with uh, suffering, and it's a, not a healthy thing, is they get very angry. And, um, you know, anger is kind of one of those crazy things. I, I know that, um, I, I know a lot of males have anger issues. Uh, females do too, but I can relate to the male aspect more readily. You know, there's just certain things that just make you crazy. Right. You know, a thousand things don't make you crazy, but there's just certain things that make you crazy. You know, sometimes we react to difficulty by getting bitter, you know, by by uh, getting recrimination. And sometimes we even get angry and we shake our fist at God. I just encountered a man that came to our church and he said, you know, I've never been to your church, but I've been listening to some of your messages online. He said, I would say you probably have 100% faith, but mine's about 50%. And I can't explain it. Life, and he said, my name is, uh, well, I can't tell you his name because that would, that would betray his confidence, but he said his first name was Miserable, and then he added his name to it. And I'm thinking to myself, how can you walk around this earth and say your name is Miserable Blank? Um, you know, that would be my, well, me like saying, you know, I say my name is Curtis, child of God. Well, my name's Miserable Curtis, and I'm miserable every day. It's like, what a way to live, not. You know, but when you don't deal with your anger in a constructive way, constructively, it affects not just you. You have to understand, our lives are like little pebbles. They ripple out. It affects our children, our spouses, our significant others, our families, our friends. Um, our anger affects everybody. And we think, well, it's my anger, and I'm going to be mad whether you like it or not. Yeah, we'll try living with somebody like that on a consistent basis. Mm, yeah. Pretty rough. And a lot of us have anger issues. We just don't know how to deal with things, so we just get mad at life. We get mad at ourselves, and we get mad... And everybody else. And um, the, the thing that it affects most is not just every relationship in life. It affects our relationship with God. Amen. Um, you know, it's impossible to go through life angry at others and maintain a warm and positive relationship with God. See, you can be angry, but you won't have a warm and positive relationship with God if you choose anger. Um, you can't, uh, you can't hate your neighbor and then say to yourself, I love God. The, the two don't work. I mean, they're, they're not together. They're not, they're not uh, congruent. You know, and at some point, you have to realize anger is a losing battle no matter what. Some believers live that way for years. Angry, angry, angry. I, I mean, I've seen that in my own, my own family and in the familial relationships in my own family. And my dad dealt with his anger by dousing it with alcohol. And he was a full-blown alcoholic for all the years that I remember him. I mean, I don't think he's that way now, but I'm not really that sure. I haven't spent any significant time with my parents in the last 30 or 40 years by their choice, not mine. But the other thing anger does, it, it just separates um, it separates family. Um, you know, there's five siblings that my, uh, that I, you know, five total children my, my parents had. I have four siblings. And um, to this day, there's no relationship really between any of us because anger and alcohol destroyed everything there was. And my parents are still alive and they're still married. And, you know, oftentimes I wondered why they were married. But back then, divorce was a curse. And I guess my mom... Um, never could imagine how she could uh, support five children without my dad. And so they, you know, there, there was physical abuse and emotional abuse and all kinds of, of horrible things. But, you know, anger is just a no-win situation. But, you know, um, angry people also have other issues because when you're anger, um, God will always seem distant to you because your anger drives everything. The other thing that anger does is, if you're angry, your prayers will seem empty. You know, because 
you know, God doesn't have to, to listen to people that are, and God doesn't. And um, that's a whole nother sermon series. I won't go there today because I could just preach on that for about another three hours. But I don't know if you guys want to spend the whole day with me. I'm not sure. But um, when you're angry, I have to tell you something. There's been times when I'm angry and my Christian experience has no life mm -hmm. when anger drives things. Mm -hmm. Because you drive God out when you, drive, when you allow anger in. So anger is just a no-win situation. And if this describes you, take a good look inside of yourself. <clears throat> because you'll never get better until you deal with the anger within you. Um, another problem that um, we have when we suffer is we blame everybody else. We blame other people. I had a very wise spiritual mentor, pastor, that told me um, at one point in my life, and this was probably about 35 to 40 years ago, he said, when there's a conflict between two people, there's no innocent party. You know, from your perspective, you think all the responsibility belongs to the other person. But that's not true. Because even if you're the somewhat innocent party in a conflict, you have some of the responsibility for the issue at hand. But we like to think, you know, and this is very popular um, nowadays, you know, it's all their fault. It's the government's fault. It's my parents' fault. Well, you're 50 years old. You know, you haven't lived with your parents since you were 18. But it's still their fault, you know. And um, you got to get over all that kind of nonsense, you know, because um, everybody um, probably uses this, you know, at some point in time. But, you know, we get bitter, you know. And, um, you know, we, uh, we allow that bitterness to take over and think that, you know, um, everything that happened, you know, uh, is somebody else's fault. Matter of fact, a, a, a while back, I, I dealt with a, a situation. It was a couple that I married in this church. And, um, you know, and I, I seriously counseled them before their marriage. And I told them, you got to be careful. And then they were very concerned about, you know, they wanted the church to be a certain way. And they wanted this to be a certain way. And the reception to be a certain way. And I said, you know, you guys are spending all this effort, all this time on the wedding. You know, when are you going to prepare for the marriage? And um, within just a couple of weeks, they started having marital problems. Mm. And, um, and I said, well, I warned you about this in advance. And um, he thought it was all her and she thought it was all him. So they blamed each other. You know, it's all the other party's fault. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it just... just the, the marriage turned into a, a difficult situation. They both had substance abuse problems. Mm. And on top of everything else, they blamed each other for all their problems. And sadly, the marriage ended in a divorce and, um, um, you know, couldn't be put back together. And it was funny because um, they invited me over to their house to counsel them even after they were married. And I tried diligently for each of them to see the other person's perspective. But they were so stuck in their ways. It was all his fault. It was all her fault. There's nothing that could be done. And, you know, so, um, so there was no God in the middle of any of it. And um, accordingly, it didn't work. But the fourth way to deal with suffering and problems that um, works is to accept it and... To learn from it. This is the only way to really deal with our suffering, to deal with our problems. We have to accept it because most of us, there's nothing we can do about getting out of it. I mean, there's been times when I've been angry and, you know, sometimes you just have to get to the point where you accept it and then you learn from it. And that's not always an instant thing because usually, you know, you're going to do things or say things in the interim before you get to this point. But our final option regarding suffering and challenges and, and losses and setbacks is, is to accept it and to learn from it. This is probably the hardest, but the best. See, you can deny it, you can get angry, you can blame somebody else, or you can accept what happens to you and begin to learn 
from it. Yeah. Of these four ways, actually this last one is the only truly Christian way of dealing with the difficulties of life. All the other ones are not Christian ways of dealing with it. When trouble comes, you know, you only have two choices. You can either become a victim or you become a student. So you can play the role of victim and say, you know, um, you know, woe is me. Or you can become a student and say, what can I learn from this experience? How can I grow from this experience? How can I get better from this experience? You know, how much better it is, you know, to be a student than a victim. Being a student means you ask yourself, what have I learned from this? Being a student, you, you can ask yourself, what is God trying to say to me? Right. Also, if you're, if you're truly a student, you can say to yourself, how can I grow from this painful experience? How can I grow and be better? You know, having said all of this, I have to admit, there's many questions that I can't answer. I can't answer, um, answer questions about why bad things happen to God's people. I don't have the answers to everything. It's funny. Some people think pastors have the answers to everything. This particular pastor does not. I mean, there might be some that do. God bless them, but I'm not that guy. And I just have to be honest with you. I'm not that guy. I don't have the answers to everything. Because people come to me all the time, and they're like, you know, this, this guy that came to me the other day is with his first name miserable. You know, he's like, I don't understand why my health is failing. And I said, well, you're up in age. It happens to everybody, including the guy you're talking to. You know, my health is failing too. It's crazy. I've been going to the physical therapist three times a week. I, I never even believed in physical therapists until just recently. Um, and, um, you know, you got to go see the dentist and the eye doctor. And it's like, I used to not do these things on such a regular basis. And so it is. But, um, you know, I mean, you know, we have to get to the point, you know, because the reasons here might seem obvious, but often the, the reasons might be much more um, obscure from us of, of why we have to deal with the things that we have to deal with. You know, and if I had all the time in the world, um, honestly, I still couldn't answer the questions about suffering because some of the issues simply defy human explanation. You know, there was a, a little girl in our church, Alicia, and um, I think she was 13 years old. This was several years ago, I think four years ago. And um, she was a, a faithful attender of this church. I mean, more faithful than you could even imagine. More faithful than most people here. But um, every Sunday when the, the door was open, she was here. Every Wednesday when the door was open, she was here. And... <clears throat> Um, she came to me one time and she said, Pastor, I want to be baptized. And I, I don't like baptizing kids at a young age because I think you have to have maturity and uh, you know peace of mind with God and really understand the tenets of faith and, and quite a few other things. And so I said, Alicia, I don't think you're ready for baptism. I'm ready for baptism. I want to be baptized so bad you don't know how bad I want to be baptized. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus will always be my Savior. I want to be baptized. So for about six months, this little girl begged me every time we were at church. Did you decide if I could get baptized? I already decided. No. But she didn't stop asking. She was just, she was just uh, incredibly determined she wanted to be baptized. So I prayed about it and thought about it. And I prayed about it some more. And I seriously gave it seriously serious consideration and finally i told her after about six months i said alicia i'm going to baptize you and this girl i mean she couldn't even put her feet on the ground i mean she was uh, you know six to twelve inches off the ground she was so excited and so i baptized her and it was a wonderful experience and it was a wonderful experience for her and and i i rarely baptize somebody in their early teens. I just don't do it. I just don't think it's prudent as a pastor. And about two weeks later, I was coming southbound on Van Dyke. And I, I, I seen all kinds of emergency lights, police cars, ambulances, fire trucks. 
Van Dyke was completely closed, both ways, north and south, but towards Topher. And I said, Lord, I said, whatever's going on down there, be with those people, because it's serious. And then I made a turn east to come onto Nine Mile Road to come to the church. And it was a Friday night about 8 o'clock. I was picked up something and was bringing it back to the church. And when I walked in the church, moments later, my phone rang. And it was one of the family members of Alicia. They said Alicia had darted out into Van Dyke in a 4 by 4 truck hit her and killed her instantly. Mm. The little girl I remember that. that. I remember that. And um, it was just heartbreaking because I prayed for that person, just seeing all the emergency vehicles, not even connecting any dots, thinking it was somebody from our church, not even realizing it was a death. I'd just seen all kinds of lights and thought it was an accident or serious, but I didn't think it was what it was. But she darted out into Van Dyke to cross the street, just had her nails done at a nail salon, and wasn't paying attention. Um, the guy wasn't charged with any crimes because it really wasn't his fault. He wasn't intoxicated or, or nothing like that was involved. It was just a senseless tragedy. And she died, and I know. <laughs> Someday I'll see her in heaven, but... You know, we just don't know when tragedy is going to hit, when tragedy strikes us. And, you know, the New Testament contains a number of helpful passages on this particular uh, subject. You know, one is, is one of the most important, and it's found in the text that we're going to look at this morning. We find in our text a liberating perspective, a perspective that all of us really need to take heart because... If you're not in the middle of pain, pressure, problems, tragedy, loss, sooner or later you will be. I mean, it's just the way it is. But I think this text will lift you up. I think the text that we're going to look at will lift you up even if you're in the throes of the deepest, desperate despair right now. If you're in the throes of darkness, I think this text will encourage you because all of us need to learn what God is saying in this passage of Scripture. Yes, Lord. And this passage of Scripture is Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at uh, a number of verses, 18 through 27. So, um, you know, I, I, I really want us to understand what God is trying to tell us. The theme of the passage is given to us in verse 18. And this is what the Apostle Paul has written under the inspiration of God. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. You know, if you have your Bibles handy, or if you think about it later, underline two words, because it was funny, when I was reading this text in my Bible, I underlined two words, suffering and glory. And you might think, well, how are those two words in the same sentence? See, Paul invites us to make a comparison between those two things, suffering and glory. They're two opposing things. I mean, most of us see our sufferings. It's easy to identify our pain, our pressures, our problems, our losses. We're acutely aware when bad things happen to us. And as I said, we all have a story. You know, whether, whether you want to admit that or not, all of us know what difficulty is all about. If you've lived any period of time or any extent of time, you know what this is all about. But there's another side to suffering and pain, pressure, and problems. It's the glory side. Yes. I mean, how many people think about glory when you're in the throes of immense personal pain and immense personal suffering? Glory! You shout out glory! Um, you know, there's suffering and then there's glory. You know, if you could put all the difficulties of your life on one side of a scale, you know, like those legal scales, the, the lady justice, you know, they have the balancing beam scale. I mean, I was thinking about this. If you could put all of your problems, all of your difficulties, all of your pain, all of your pressure on one side of the scale, and then the glory that will someday be revealed to you on the other side of the scale. The glory would be so much heavier than the present sufferings 
that they'd be blown away like a feather. I mean, like dust. I mean, your little problems that are huge and magnanim magnanimous. Yeah, I'll say that three times. I mean, you know, you think they're like overwhelming big, but the glory that's yet to be revealed is so much greater. Amen. See, the sufferings of this life, although they're terrible, and even uh, they're not even worth comparing with the greatness of the glory that's to come. The greatness of the glory that the Lord himself will reveal unto each of us. And this is a revolutionary perspective on life. That glory that's yet to come, if you ever let the, the, the thought grip you, what God has is immeasurably, immensely greater than what you're going through. See, the glory that God has, it'll literally explode your brain, it's so great. But right now, we usually just kind of wallow in our pain and wallow in our problems and wallow in our losses. But if you let the glory aspect resonate in your mind, it would revolutionize the way that you look at your problem and your pain, your losses, etc., and I think there's some truths that we need to grasp from this text. I think truths that are that are so that are so outstanding that um, these truths really need to be considered. There's three unchanging truths about suffering that all of us need to come to grips with. These truths are axioms that should form the Christian attitude towards suffering, pain, problems losses. The number one truth is our suffering is temporary. This is verses 19 through 22 in Romans 8. And a lot of times when we're in the midst, we rarely think that our suffering is temporary. It's like, oh my God, this is going to last forever. Um, you know, I don't know, whatever. But our suffering is always temporary. Actually, the, the, the creation waits, as the text reads, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay, and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, yes. as in the pains of childbirth, right up to this present time. I've never experienced childbirth myself, but I was in close proximity, being the father of three biological, I mean four biological, three sons and a daughter, so four biolog biological children, and I can kind of give you some glimpses of what that pain of childbirth is like. Screaming, yelling, um, scratching, and I had wounds. I never photographed them, but, you know, um, all those things happen in childbirth. And I happened to be in such close proximity that uh, I benefited from those, from those things. But, you know, we live in a frustrating world. You know, a lot of us think that, you know, our street should be easy street. And I don't know if you know this or not, but there is a street in Warren called Easy Street. But there's only commercial buildings on that street. There's no houses, so I don't think any of us live on Easy Street. So, you know, in this life, you know, we probably have, if we've lived any particular period of time, realized nothing works the way it's supposed to. You know, I mean, we have the expectations that things are supposed to be a certain way. But... It's probably no secret to tell you this morning that nothing, and I mean nothing, works the way it's supposed to. You buy something, and then it breaks. It's like, <sighs> then you fix it, and it works for a little while, then it breaks again. I mean, eventually it wears out completely, and then you have to replace it. You know what I'm talking about. Amen. You know, that's what Paul means when he says that the creation was suggested subjected to frustration. I mean, nothing lasts forever, nothing works exactly right, and we live, 
get this, this is real theologically. This is real theological. We live in a Murphy's Law world and universe. And if you know anything about Murphy's Law, you know what I'm talking about. Those young people are like, what's that? I have to Google that later. But, you know, it's not just creation, though. It's you and me, too. You know, nothing works the way it's supposed to be. You don't work right. Your mind doesn't always work right. Your body doesn't always work right. You know, children are born with horrible defects. We get cancer. We have Alzheimer's. We have AIDS or some other wasting disease. And if you live long enough, you might have a stroke or you might have a heart attack or you might get senile and end up in a nursing home or some kind of care facility. And I don't want to be a, a downer this morning, but that's ahead for all of us. I mean, sooner or later, there's no escape for any of us because unless you live in some other alternate universe, you know, your body is decaying, breaking down as you get older, and things are just going to happen. You know, or you could happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, just a couple weeks ago, uh, I think it was the Southfield Freeway, there was some guy shooting at cars just randomly going down the Southfield Freeway. Crazy people doing crazy stuff. You can be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and then it happens. You know, um, just before the new year, there was a couple small children involved in a shooting in Detroit, right here in Warren. Um, a mother and her child, the little boy was killed in a, a crazy drug related issue. I think the little boy was only five or six years old. Yeah. Did he deserve what he got? Of course not. But, I mean, the father was a drug dealer. He was taken into Detroit, and he was killed in his rental car. And then the people that killed him came back and, and killed his girlfriend and a five-year-old little innocent child right here in Warren. So sometimes we're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But verse 21 speaks of the bondage to decay. You know, something happens at my house every Wednesday. I don't know if you guys have ever been over to my house at Wednesday. I'm not suggesting you come over, but every Wednesday, there's a couple trucks pull up to my house. The first truck picks up my garbage, and the second truck picks up my recycling. And it, it's like clockwork. I mean, every single, every single Wednesday, you know, this happens. Why? Because the flow of garbage and recycling never ceases. I mean, if you live, the outproduct of living is garbage and recycling. I mean, I don't know if you notice that, but I notice that. And, you know, the more we waste, the more garbage we produce. And it just kind of happens that way. And if you doubt that, you know, what if the garbage guys were on strike for about a month? Or maybe even just a week or two, your garbage would be overflowing. You know, there'd be a fast mountain of garbage that piles up. See, we live in a decaying, frustrating world. It just happens. You know, you, you watch the news and you read about flooding and disasters and hurricanes and tornadoes. You read about storms and famines and earthquakes. You read about children, you know, that are innocent, that... Their lives are taken at an early age. You read about starvation and famine in Haiti and Somalia and Bosnia. You know, I mean, you look at the news and you know that there's great unrest in the Middle East. People every, almost every single day from the Middle Eastern countries, they shoot rockets into Israel and Israel shoots them back. Fires rockets back. But it doesn't take very much intelligence to realize something has gone terribly wrong in our world. You know, it's not the world that God meant it to be. See, a lot of us, we want to think we live in a perfect world. We want a perfect world. But we live in a world that's full of pain. We live in a world that's full of suffering. We live in a world that's full of death. You know, this is a world that's messed up. 
and knocked out of kilter. And why is that? Because of the entrance of sin. You know, I don't know if you remember President Nixon, whether you liked President Nixon or not, but it was probably one of the first presidents that I actually had knowledge of in my own early life. Nixon was the president, and his wife, Pat Nixon, she had her issues. She was the former first lady, and she was wonderful and gracious by all accounts. You know, she died back in the 90s, and she had a lengthy illness. And um, it was funny because for years I followed Billy Graham, and Billy Graham actually did her funeral. And the reason I know that is because it, it was posted online and um, Billy Graham said, in all of my life, I've known the Nixons for over 40 years. He said, I've never heard a single person say a negative thing about Pat Nixon, the wife of the president. You know, it's funny because I often say at funerals, they make pastors liars because, yeah, Charlie was a good guy. You know he was a little <laughs> devil. <laughs> You know, Aunt Rose was a sweet person. You know she was evil. <laughs> That's one of the things I just don't like about funerals, you know. Sometimes you have to tell things that just aren't actually very accurate. But, you know, many national leaders were at this particular funeral. Actually, um, i seen clips of it years ago, um, including um, President Ford and and Reagan, the Nixon family sat in the front row, and Billy Graham gave a wonderful message, as he always did, about such things. And at the end of the service, at the honor guard, was carrying out the casket of, of Pat Nixon. Something unusual happened. They sang the song, America the Beautiful, at a funeral. I thought that was a little odd. It, as a matter of fact, it was so odd, it stuck to me to this day. And at that moment, the camera zoomed in on President Nixon, who had just lost his wife, and they were carrying her body out from the church. And whether you like him or not, or whatever you say about him, I'm not sure, but, you know, he was a towering political figure back in post-World War II America. And at that particular point, he's been at the top, he's been at the bottom, he left office in disgrace. He's been known for great victories and great public humiliation. But when the camera panned over to that and I was watching the video, you know, I seen something that was pretty powerful. One of the most powerful men the world has ever known, the President of the United States. And as they took his wife's casket away, he reached up his hands and had to wipe tears from his eyes. You know, this guy, you know that uh, you either like or you hate him, but even for somebody as great as the President of the United States, they deal with loss, they deal with pain. So what's the lesson in all of this? It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether you've got a pauper or the most powerful man in the world. It doesn't even matter if you're the President of the United States. If you live long enough, you'll know pain. You'll know loss. You'll know heartache. And if you live long enough, you'll probably brush tears away from your eyes as they come at death's door. See, we live in a frustrating world, a world that's filled with pain, a world that's filled with suffering. So do you know what entropy is? the word entropy. You may or may not, but entropy is the second law of thermodynamics. So we'll have a little lesson here this morning. It's the law that says in any closed system, energy always moves from complexity to randomness. That's the, the law of entropy. The second law tells us that our universe is moving from order to disorder. I don't know if you realize that or not, from harmony to disharmony. Everything in the universe, left to itself, will just run down, will break down. So 
I used to wear a wristwatch before I had a cell phone. And if I left my watch alone, sooner or later, I'll tell you what would happen. Okay. It would die. It runs down, it stopped. And this is the same principle is, is you know, it needed to be rewound on a regular basis. Otherwise, it would just stop functioning. It's the same principle why the beds in your house don't stay made. <laughs> and that's why your daughter's bedroom doesn't stay clean. It's the law of entropy. That's why you have to mow your grass. See, if you left your grass alone, before long you'd be living in a jungle. And the city would give you a ticket, especially in Warren. For sure. Guaranteed. Why? Because we're living in a universe where things always run down. It's just the way life works. You know, in the last couple of months, I've been dealing with some dental issues. And, um, you know, this dentist I got keeps telling me, well, as you get older, your teeth break down, your enamel breaks down. I have to pull these ones and do this. And you need a partial now. What's that? You know, I don't like that. It doesn't fit in my mouth and what have you. You know, and um, it was funny because I had one good tooth. And I thought they put, I thought they put caps and, and fillings in your teeth um, because it saved your tooth. Well, they have this little fish hook round little thing that she puts in your mouth. She's poking around, poking around, poking around. She says, you have a cavity in your filling. And it's like, wait a minute. That's what the filling's for. How can I have a cavity in the filling? You drilled out the cavity, put a filling in there, now you're telling me I have a cavity in my filling. I mean, in life, things just break down. And so, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to me, so she decided that, you know, you know, she said, well, that's just how it works because, you know, there's more tooth decay because it just kind of happens that way and it happens that way with all the things in the universe they just kind of break down and um and that causes me to think about another thing not just tooth decay but as we live you know some of us have heart decay and body decay and spiritual decay but i got great news for you one day all those things are going to be removed amen See, one day you won't experience any of those things. See, from the Christian point of view, the Christian viewpoint on suffering, you have to say, yes, that's bad, but it's not going to last forever. Yeah, this is a tough spot, but it won't last forever. Yes, it's terrible, but this isn't the final story. See, this isn't the last chapter. Yes, we suffer. But God has an ordained point that makes our suffering temporary. Something better for us is on the way if you're truly a believer in Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yes. <clears throat> and that's the first axiom. Our suffering is only temporary. The second axiom is this. Our suffering is educational. <clears throat> Who wants to sign up this morning for an education? We're going to look at verses 23 and 25. They read as follows. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. What hope for what had, had he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. See, Paul says we groan inwardly. <clears throat> we groan because we have a job we hate. You know, I've been going to the same job for 10 years. I didn't like it on the first day, and 10 years later, I don't like it now. You know, it's funny, and, uh, you know, we groan because our dreams are unfulfilled. You know, I've had these dreams in my head 
but they've never come to pass, so I groan. We groan because our bodies break down. We groan because <coughs> marriages break up. Relationships go astray. We groan because our children go wayward. We groan because our friends disappoint us. See, why does God allow groaning amongst his children? You think, well, if he's God, he could just fix this. I mean, after all, he's God, right? He could just make this go away. He is God, so he could do that. You know, we imagine maybe even God laughing as we weep. You know, I'm down here broken, crying. And God must be up there laughing. Oh, my goodness. But that's not so. God doesn't laugh. You know, he knows what we're going through. God knows exactly what we're going through. He cares about our sufferings, even when we think he doesn't care about our sufferings. You see, one thing you might not realize, God also feels our own pain. He knows the pain that we're experiencing. See, the, the Bible tells us that God allows our pain for a purpose. In verses 24 and 25, it tells us that through our suffering, God wants to develop two things in you, in us. The first thing he wants to develop in us is hope. The second thing God wants to develop in us is patience. And I know there's some people that feel hopeless, and there's some people that have no patience at all. But God, in his divine wisdom, he'll develop both of those things in you if you give him enough time. See, let me explain to you what hope is. Hope is that settled confidence that looks to the future. You have confidence to know that, that God someday will keep every single one of his promises. That's hope. You know that God will keep all of his promises. Patience is the ability to endure the present hardship because you have hope in the future. See, our suffering is educational in that it teaches us to hope and it teaches us patience, two qualities that you can't gain any other way than through hardship and suffering. You only hope for that which you do not have. See, you don't hope for things that you already have. If you have it, you don't have to hope for it. Hope is something in the future. But if you don't have it, then hope teaches you to patiently wait for it. So when you don't have it, you have to patiently wait for it. So what are you waiting for? What is it that we're waiting for? Paul calls it our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. That's what this text says. We're waiting for the day when our bodies will be redeemed. See, your body will redeem, be redeemed. When we can turn that old model in, the one that you don't like, the one that you see in the mirror, and say, Lord, I just wish you could fix it. Well, one day God's going to give you a brand new, spanking brand new body. You know, in that day, we'll be adopted as sons or daughters. That is, we'll enter into our full legal standing as children of God. See, right now in this age, we are children of God living in decaying bodies. Thank Adam for that. See, you can't tell by the outside what's going on on the inside. We look like everyone else pretty much. We get sick, our bodies decay, eventually we die. But because we're related to Jesus Christ, someday we'll be given a body Amen. just like Jesus Christ's body. What does that body look like? It's incorruptible. It's immortal. It's undying. That's what the body of Christ looks like. That's the same body we will be given. See, we don't have it yet, so we're eagerly waiting for that day to come. Let me illustrate this a little bit further. If you had the power to change your body, would you use it? I mean, seriously. I mean, suppose you could instantly change the way you look. Would you do it? You know, you might say, that's just a dumb question, especially for church. 
I mean, dumb. I mean, hello? The question is not, would you use that power? But would it be a simple repair or a complete makeover? I mean, everything new. Would you say, Lord, let's just start over from scratch? Because, you know, I mean, wait a minute. If you use that power, you know, would you even recognize you if you looked in the mirror? See, our bodies wear out. This is no surprise to anybody. You know, when I, when I was in my teens and 20s and early 30s, you know, I thought I had more mojo than I really had. And now that I've gotten through 40s and into 50s, you know, I'm starting to realize our bodies wear out. And don't laugh, but they also sag. You know, they expand. I've noticed a couple wrinkles, so they know they wrinkle too. And then I noticed a few other things. Joints get creaky. Arteries harden. The doctor says I got a strong heart. It's not as good as it used to be, but it's, you know, our hearts slow down. Some other stuff happens. You know, our eyes grow a little dimmer than they used to. You know, our teeth fall out. Some people, their backs get stooped. You know, I got to tell you, sometimes our arms grow weary. Mm -hmm. See, our bodies get to the point where bones break, muscles weaken, the body bulges in all the wrong places. It happens to all of us. Sooner or later, it just happens. But there's a day coming when your body won't need changing at all. You see... You won't grow old, you won't get cancer, because Jesus Christ will give you a brand new body. Amen. And until then, we live in hope, waiting patiently for that day to come. The perspective explains so much of what happens to us. See, God is weaning us away from putting our hope in the things of this world, so that our hope will be in him alone. Amen. See, so many of us, they buy lotions and potions and the late night absolute, you can have six packs, lose all the weight you need, and it all happens in 10 days if you pay money to that person on late night TV. Mm -hmm. I don't even watch TV. I've told, been told about such things because I don't have a TV, so I don't know from personal experience, but it's funny, people come to me and they're like, you know, I could go on this diet I seen on TV last night, you know? For $59.99, I can lose 40 pounds in a week. Good luck. <laughs> I've been trying to lose like 70 pounds for a year and it hasn't worked. So good luck to you. But I mean, think about it. We live in this world where we can't get away from suffering and difficulty. See, God brings you to the place where you must say, Lord, it's you and it's you alone. I mean, when are you going to get to the point? The new year is a great place to start. Stop thinking it's all about you. Because in reality, it's never been about you. You only thought that. You know, God's teaching you to wait on him. And sometimes more of us go through extra pain and difficulties and suffering because we didn't learn in the first 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or 50 years. I mean... Look at the children of Israel. They spent years wandering in the desert on a 12 to 15 day journey. Some people just, it takes them a little longer. Some people, it takes them a lifetime. Some people never get there. See, right now, you might be trying to scheme your way into a better situation. You know, if only this. If only I had the winning numbers to the lottery. You know, if only I had a better boyfriend or a better girlfriend. If only, if only, if only. I mean, you're scheming, you're playing, you're fantasizing. But eventually, if you really truly know the Lord, you'll say, Lord, if it takes forever, go ahead, take your time. My hope is in you. Amen. Because if you're truly a Christian, that's what you'll say. My only hope is in you. 
is not in anything else. My only hope is in you. And Lord, I trust even if it takes forever. Thank you, Lord. One of the other axioms, the other axiom that I want to tell you about is, the last axiom is, are sufferings actually beneficial? Do you know when you go through pain, pressure, problems, and suffering and loss, there's a benefit to it? Look what the text says. This is verses 26 and 27 in Romans 8. The text reads as follows. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Yes. See, the Spirit of God helps us. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us yes. with groans that words cannot express. And he, the Holy Spirit, who searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. You know, it sounds strange to say that our suffering can somehow be beneficial to us. You know, you might say, I've suffered a lot and I can't see the benefit. But there is, some would even say <coughs> that suffering or saying suffering is beneficial, that's even not Christian or unchristian. You know, you might say, well, I have cancer. How could cancer be beneficial? You know, um, I lost my job and now I don't have a paycheck. How's that beneficial? You know, I'm the product of a broken marriage. How could that be beneficial? You know, how could being publicly humiliated be beneficial? You know, how could tears in the midnight hour and languishing in pain or turmoil, how could that be beneficial? But our text explains it this way. Our suffering reveals our weakness. You see, it strips away the mask of self-sufficiency and reveals our utter helplessness. See, God wants us to depend on him. It forces us to confront our inabilities. It makes us say, I'm not as strong <clears throat> as I thought I was. I'm not as, in, as, as invincible as I thought I was. See, verse 26 says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Imagine that, the Spirit that's in us helps us when we're weak. The word translated help means to come along and aid someone who's in desperate need. Amen. And that's what the Holy Spirit of God, I mean, I looked this up and I thought, help, well, what does that mean? You know, the, 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 the Holy Spirit comes to the aid of someone who knows no other end and is in desperate need. See, you're in the hands watching a race and you see the runner faltering in the final turn, he stumbles and he's about to fall. Seeing that he's not going to make it to the finish line, you rush from the stands and you come to his side. You put your arm around him and say, Brother, I see you're not going to make it to the finish line. Let me help you to that final place. See, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He sees when we're in trouble. He sees when we're in difficulty. He sees when we're in despair. And the Holy Spirit comes to our aid. I just listened to a New Year's message uh, two days ago from Max Locato and Dr. David Jeremiah, two of my favorite Christian commentators of, of this day. And they said something simple that was so profound, it, it hit me like a brick. They said, as a Christian... You've never experienced a day when you were unloved. See, a lot of us feel we're distant from God, and where's God's love, and where's God's kindness? And they were explaining that there's never been a day, if you're truly in Christ, that you should have ever felt unloved. That's how strong God's love for us really is. See, how does the Holy Spirit do this? How does the Holy Spirit come to our aid? Paul tells us that the Spirit intercedes for us Amen. with groans that words cannot express. The Holy Spirit prays for us. The Holy Spirit, who himself is the third member of the Trinity, prays to the Father, who is the first member of the Trinity, in the name of the Son, who is the second member of the Trinity, for us 
in that moment of great weakness when we think we can't go on. It's God's praying to God on behalf of God's children. How awesome is that? God praying to God on behalf of you. Wow. Have you ever thought about that? How, think about the power of this. God praying to God. The Holy Spirit interceding on our behalf. That's what this text is really saying. What, is, what an amazing thought that is. God praying to God on behalf of you. I mean, it's just crazy. You know, there's been a few times in my life where I couldn't utter words. I was devastated or in, in pain or, 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 or situations. You've just emotionally exhausted. You've tried to pray, but words just don't come out and there's words that just aren't there. Sometimes you get so frightened. That's all you can do is cry out, oh God. Sometimes you can't even say that. You can't pray. You can't put together a prayer. It's happened to me several times. But God. My God. But God. God praying to God in our weakness. I mean, and that leads me to this observation. The more you care about something, the harder it is to pray about it. Okay, and the reason is, you know, it's easy to pray for others because we're not that deeply invested in them. It's easy to pray for people that you don't really know because it doesn't really matter that much because it's not personal to us whether our prayers get answered or not. See, the more you care, the, the harder it is to pray. When it comes to those things in our lives that really matter most, your husband, your children, your wife, those other things, it's harder to pray for those because they're so close to your heart. I remember my firstborn son, Curtis, my namesake child, Curtis number two, Curtis the second. When he was a little guy, he was less than a year old, he had some serious and major medical conditions that required uh, very intensive surgery, invasive surgery. And I remember we brought him to the hospital, this little talkative, beautiful kid. And he's mine, so I can tell you he's the most beautiful kid in the world at that point. And they, they laid him on a gurney, and he's laughing and smiling and not even having any import into what's about to happen. And my heart is so heavy, knowing that they're going to cut my little kid open, wide open, and try to fix him. I didn't have prayers that I could speak. I just was bewildered because they weren't even sure that they could fix the problem. And so I'm thinking, this might not even work. Lord, I need you. But I didn't know how to pray. And then the nurse came in and the anesthesiologist came in and they're like, well, you have a very active child. We're going to give him a couple shots to just settle him down and then we'll wheel him off into the surgical suite and put him under and carry on with the surgery. They call it twilight or whatever. So just in a matter of injecting two shots in my son, he just completely calmed down and he was just pretty much just laying there. And then the surgeon came in and said, it's time. And I remember them wheeling my son into the surgery room and thinking, Lord, I don't even know what to pray. This is my kid, my only kid at the time. And it was pretty devastating. We had another child on the way at the time, but I don't think she was born yet. If I remember the order of things correctly, I'm not sure I do. But we get to that point where we can't even cry out a prayer. But we might say, oh God, and the message is, don't worry, because there's someone inside of you that's lifting your situation up before the throne of God. There's a God inside of you, the Holy Spirit, praying to God on your behalf. See, we know that Jesus is in heaven praying for us, but Paul takes us a step further. When you come to that moment of complete exhaustion, when you come to that moment where you can't even frame words, you don't even have to worry. 
the Holy Spirit will pray for you. In your weakness, the Holy Spirit is strong. And when you can't speak, the Holy Spirit of God will speak on your behalf for you Amen. to God. Amen. See, when we lean against that wall of desperation, when we cry out to God, when we whisper, Lord, I don't even know what to say. I don't know how to pray. And the Holy Spirit comes along you and says, don't worry, I'll pray for you. And he does. I've talked about Martin Luther many times. Martin Luther, I'm not speaking about Martin Luther King, I'm speaking about Martin Luther, the Christian reformer some 500 years ago that um, broke away from the Catholic Church. And I studied Luther in, in school and and, and have read a number of his writings. And when I was thinking about this text, I was thinking about something that Martin Luther wrote nearly 500 years ago. He said, it's a good thing if we occasionally receive the opposite of what we pray for, because that's a sign that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. See, sometimes we pray and we don't get what we pray for and we think something's wrong. We, we think something's amiss. You know, we may be praying, Lord, do this and this and this. And meanwhile, the Holy Spirit's inside of you saying, Lord, what he means is not that. What he really means is this, this, and that. You know, don't pay any attention to what he's praying for. He said thus and so, but I saw the bigger picture. And what he really wants is such and such. You might not see how this works or understand what I just said, but... As we pray from our weak and limited perspective, the Holy Spirit corrects our prayers, if you will, or so to speak. And so God's will is always done, even in our most wrong-headed prayers. Because sometimes our prayers aren't right. Sometimes our prayers are straight up wrong. And since the Holy Spirit knows what God's will is for our life, and since the Holy Spirit searches our hearts, we see this in verse 27 in the text that we just looked at he's able to pray for us in ways that always correspond with God's will but might be contrary to what we were thinking one sign of this is actually happening happening is that we pray for one thing and then God does the exact opposite does that mean our prayers were in vain nope not at all does it mean that we shouldn't pray nope not at all. It simply reveals our inherent human weakness and our inherent human limitation from our perspective in this life. See, we see our part, but the Holy Spirit sees the whole picture. We don't see the whole picture, but the Spirit of God does. And when we see our little piece, the Holy Spirit sees the big picture and we pray according to that little piece we see. And the Holy Spirit sees everything. And then the Holy Spirit prays according to his perfect knowledge. According to God's will. I just want to end this with a few final thoughts. Number one is this. Suffering is a necessary part of the human life. See, you may think that you'd like to live in the land of Cush. Yeah. You know, maybe you maybe you thought, I'd love to live on Easy Street. I wish Pastor would tell me where that's at. You know, where we don't have any problems, we don't have any pain, we don't have any difficulties. But I gotta tell you something. You wouldn't enjoy living on Easy Street. There is no such thing as the land of Cush. Your life would be much worse than it is right now because suffering is a part of the Christian experience as we journey from earth to heaven. It's just the way it is. The second thought that I want to share with you this morning is God uses our present suffering to prepare us for future glory. Like I said, the glory that we'll experience someday will be so much weightier than anything we've ever experienced in this life. That's the theme of this whole passage. This life is basic training for eternity. Think about it this way. Basic training. You go to hell and back in basic training if you got a tough drill instructor. And God is using everything 
that is happening in this present life, this life, including the things that you think, this is senseless, this is crazy. But God's preparing you for your future glory. In this life, you won't know the answers to all those questions. You won't be able to answer that why. But in this life to come, you'll either know all the answers or it won't matter because the glory will be so great Amen. that you'll simply forget the questions that you had in the past. See, God's coming glory is going to be so great that it'll overcome everything. Either you'll end up forgetting the questions or you'll find out all the answers. But either way, you'll end up completely satisfied because of the glory of Almighty God. And the third point that I want to make is, in the meantime, we know that our suffering can never separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. See, some of us think, well, because we're going through something, and I'm not talking about the things you create, because a lot of us, we create unnecessary pain, pressure, problems, and suffering that we just bring to ourselves by our own poor choices. I'm talking about things that just happen. But, you know, nothing can separate us. In all that I have said to you, you can find great comfort in this idea. You can hang your hat on this if you have one, but God still loves you. God loves you in spite of yourself. God loves you in spite of your choices. He loves you as much in the darkness as he did in the light. See, God always loves us. Nothing you're going through can separate you from the love of God. In Christ Jesus. Nothing, nothing, nothing. With that thought, let's keep going Amen. for the Lord. See, you have to be encouraged. Child of God, if there's anything, start this new year encouraged. Like I said, both in my past Wednesday message and in my New Year's Eve message as we prayed in the new year, Jesus. you know, Close the book on 2020. It doesn't matter. Amen. That's the past. Amen. Paul said in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, he said, this one thing I do, forgetting that which is behind, I press to the mark of the high calling of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to press. See, it doesn't mean to sit and wonder. It doesn't mean to sit in sorrow. It doesn't mean to throw temper tantrums and be angry and crazy and stupid. Right. You have to press to the mark of the high calling. Mm -hmm. You do everything you can, and God will do the rest. Amen. See, God loves you no matter what. God loves you even when you don't love Him. Amen. I mean, imagine that. Amen. See, that doesn't work in human relationships. <laughs> God loves you even when you're not loving Him. He loves you when you feel utterly alone. He loves you with an everlasting love. God loves you. I mean, His love is different than human love. Human love's fickle and failing and all that crazy stuff. God loves you no matter what. See, your suffering can take many things away from you. It can take your health your happiness, your prosperity, your popularity, your marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, it could take away a lot of things. Your suffering can take away almost everything. But there's one thing suffering can't do. It can't take away the love of Almighty God. Amen. It never can. And so when we finally reach heaven, each of us will discover that God himself was with us every step along the way even when we thought in our own little dumb minds he wasn't there he was there he was encouraging us he was praying for us you know we'll stand in his presence one day redeemed and glorified Amen. fully redeemed yes. fully glorified every trace of that decay of this world that will be left so far behind you won't even remember it and if you do it won't matter See, the sufferings of this life will be but a dim memory. It'll be fading into the mist of a forgotten yesterday. And until then, 
since we cannot see the face of our God, let us trust mm -hmm. under the shadow of his almighty wings. Mm -hmm. And we can. Right. We can have absolute trust in the shadow of his almighty wings. Amen? Amen. Amen. Gracious Father, I thank you for this word, Amen. and I thank you that you've blessed us. Not an easy passage for us to grasp, Lord, but Lord, it's part of life. Lord, let us make better choices and godly choices. Let us live the life of righteousness based on the holiness and the righteousness that you've imputed to each of us through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us rely on the Holy Spirit, the great encourager, the great comforter, the one who's there and is praying from God to God on our behalf. I hope that resonates in our minds this morning, Lord, that the Holy Spirit that is in us is praying from God to God on behalf of each one when we feel weak, when we feel that we can't make it, when we feel that we can't take another step. Lord, you're right there. You're right there with us, by us, through us, and certainly in us. Bless us, Lord, as we take this word. Let us write this word on the tablets of our heart. As I encouraged everybody when I started this, this time in studying Romans 8, I said, Lord, that we would memorize the 39 verses in this chapter. They're that theologically and doctrinally important. That we would memorize them, that we would make them a part of our lives. I still have that prayer, Lord, that we each would memorize this word. That we would commit it to memory, write it on the tablets of our heart. But most importantly, Lord, that we would live it out and apply it. And be the saints that you want us to be. Let us not just be hearers of the word and say that was a good word. Let us be doers and livers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.